Hello. Hello, how are you? Hey. Are you in a car? <laughs> Yeah, I have a good excuse that I was at the White House, but that's about all I got for you, Dave. <laughs> so what I are you gonna... coming from the White House. So anyway, it's all good. I don't want to make you any more late. I'm so excited about doing this. It's all good. Well, thank you very much. I'm going to turn this over to John Koenig, who's the president of Fredrickson and Byron, to welcome everybody. All right. Very good. Hi, John. Hey, Amy. How are you? Or Senator, how are you? Good. I should have taken up pictures with all the with Kamala and all the group there to prove my excuse, like a you know a, a truancy excuse from school. But I'm really happy to be on, and thank you for doing this. I love your firm and do great work. So thank you. Uh, uh, you're welcome, and we're we're really happy you're here. And and this wasn't the way we're going to start, but but it's it's uh it's pretty it's a cool way to start. You're coming you back go. from the White House. We at least I'm wearing a seatbelt and I'm not yes. driving. Yes. So I'll, I'll get started. Um, I want to thank everybody for being patient. I want to welcome everyone. Um, and um, if you don't know who I am, my name is John Koenig and I'm president of Fredrickson and Byron or on the internet, fredlaw.com. And at Fredlaw, our motto is we're the law, we're the law firm where law and business meet. And if you're interested in topics at the intersection of where law and business meet. And, and it's really appropriate that Senator Klobuchar is in a car right now. Today, we have a program right up your alley, a conversation about monopolies and economic competition and much more between two old friends who've known each other for 35 years. And during the Q&A part of the program, that conversation will involve all of you. One of those old two friends, those two old friends, uh, whom I will introduce in just a minute is one of the most distinguished lawyers in Minnesota and the other old friend whom you all just met and whom David Lillehog will introduce in a second more formally is the distinguished senior senator from Minnesota and a strong and effective national leader in our country. I'm honored to introduce David Lillehog. Uh, David is as upper Midwestern as you can get. He was born in Iowa, he grew up in South Dakota, and he spent most of his professional career in Minnesota. Since he graduated from the Harvard Law School, he's done just about everything a lawyer can do. He clerked for a federal district court judge in Minnesota. He worked for a, a vice president of the United States who was from Minnesota. He's been the U.S. attorney in Minnesota. He's run for public office. He's been a partner at two large law firms in Minnesota, most recently at Fredrickson and Byron. He's handled large and important cases, and he's done much pro bono work in Minnesota. And on top of all that, he served as a justice on the Minnesota Supreme Court until last year when he left that position to continue his career at Fredrickson and Byron. So David, please take it away. Well, thank you, John, for that very generous introduction. And Fredrickson and Byron is delighted to host Senator Amy Klobuchar. She's been elected to the Senate from Minnesota three times, campaigned for president, and now is chair of the powerful Senate Rules Committee. They always say powerful when they say Senate Rules Committee. And I'm proud to call her a friend of 35 years. So welcome, Senator. Now, audience okay. members, if you have any questions for the Senator, please use the Q&A feature. And I will try not to be like the usual Zoom host who completely disregards the Q&A feature. So, Senator, we're here to talk today about your new book titled Antitrust and subtitled Taking on Monopoly Power from the Gilded Age to the Digital Age. My first question is non-substantive. Your first book was called The Senator Next Door, which is a pretty good title. I was expecting your next book to be called The Senator in a Blizzard in honor of your <laughs> presidential announcement. But instead, we get antitrust which in the book you acknowledge sounds boring. How did you convince your publisher to get you to publish a, a, a book with a boring title? Uh, well, first of all, it's not that boring, the title. I thought it was kind of a metaphor uh, for the lack of trust right now uh, that we're seeing um, a, across the way in government um, and you name it. And I also felt that this subject is long overdue of serious exploration. And when you think of movement, and how they started. Uh, yes, you've got you know, vibrant speeches and people with pitchforks, but you also have thoughtful research and thoughtful suggestions. And that's just been missing 
uh, right now uh, in our discussion of this. And it is affecting everyone. Cable rates affect people. Um, the uh, lack of choice when it comes to online travel, obviously the lack of privacy when it comes to tech. Um, and when you look through all of it in the history of America, we have been a country of entrepreneurs, of people uh, that you know left England way, way back because they wanted religious uh, freedom, they wanted political freedom, and they wanted economic freedom. And it feels like uh, we are, you'll be amused, uh, Dave, if I've gone blank, it's because um, my husband was calling me. <laughs> Here he goes. Now I hung up on him. <laughs> so you can see me again. Um, we should just, I think so. I'm telling we should pull over because it's hard to do this way. Um, and so um, the, so what we wanted is we've wanted freedom. We've wanted liberty. And this uh, in the last uh few decades we've really fallen off uh when it comes to uh when it comes to our competition policy so i thought it was long overdue to put this together and put it in a book and the publisher agreed to do it yes they agreed to put in over 100 cartoons which you don't get all the time uh they agreed to um uh, a very lengthy book which included um, um my husband's uh footnotes which i give him full credit for and if I had not included them, you know, I didn't want to hurt our marriage. So they're all in there in depth. Um, and uh, so they agreed to do it. I think they they knew as well from the book publishing area on down. We've had a huge amount of consolidation. One thing I found interesting when I read the book, and probably unlike some of your interviewers, I have read the book, is that yeah. there's a Minnesota... I've had liberal... interviewers uh, admit freely they haven't read the book, Yes. <laughs> Yeah, tell, tell John I didn't read all the footnotes, though. Okay. Um, anyway, I, in your book, you discuss a Minnesota legal connection to your interest in antitrust. Tell us about your work as a young lawyer representing a client in the telecom industry and how that's affected your view of competition. Sure, and that goes back to the Minnesota roots. Uh, when I was at Dorsey and then moved over to Gray Plant Moody, I represented MCI, and that was my big client. And the entire time they were rattling the cages to basically get into the competition of uh, local service. And uh, it was an incredible thing because um, that was, we were always on the side, nearly always of the attorney general's office of the department of public service um, and on competition because that brought rates down. And when you go back to the source of it, uh, MCI was really one of the major pushers to get AT&T to break up. In fact, one of the funnier stories that I told once in a regulatory hearing was you all heard of, um, of the start with Alexander Graham Bell and uh, Watson and all these profound things that happened. Well, when um, MCI started um, from St. Louis to Chicago uh, service, um, the, the minute the phone picked up, one of their in investors said something like, I'll be damned, this actually works, much less profound. Um, and uh, they basically pushed the envelope um, and it was uh, the breakup of AT&T, which involved many different administrations, Democratic and Republican, which is, by the way, really relevant to today since the Trump administration with some really good career people in justice and in uh, the FTC brought those suits against Facebook and Google. And now the Biden administration is continuing them on. Well, when you look back at AT&T, uh, this was about um, uh, many administrations, they brought down the cost of long distance and the cell phone industry, which in its incipiency was basically a cell phone the size of Gordon Gecko's briefcase in the movie Wall Street, uh, ends up um, as, um, is there something, I, oh yeah, you're holding up the phone. You're holding up a big phone. I'm of course thinking we're having technical difficulties, um, but um, uh, that we saw this big transformation and better for consumers. And I think that's really relevant to where we are today with tech. Um, and no one said, oh, we hate AT&T. They gave us horrible products. No, they gave us great products for years and years and years. But at some point they became so dominant um, over both vertically um, over all the equipment and then horizontally over all the phone service that everyone realized we're not gonna be able to have our next great innovation in a big, big way if we don't open up competition. And that's where we are right now with tech. In your book, you also indicate that maybe some of your interest in antitrust is genetic. 
tell us about mining on the Iron Range and and how that affected your your populism. Well, no one ever phrased it that way, but that is correct. So my grandpa, iron ore miner, uh, working for Monopolis, his his uh, dad lived in company housing and um my grandma decided two generations working for monopolis um and she instilled in her sons um this really big sense of trying to try other things and um, now we've seen more competition in uh various areas but back then it was all monopolist i still remember my mom driving us by the james j hill house and uh saying in saint paul and saying um you know what, your grandpa built this house. No, that wasn't technically true. I believed it at the time, uh, but it was a metaphor for the fact that the workers in Northern Minnesota were feeding the rail trust, were feeding the steel trust, and that was their job. And by the way, my immigrant great-grandparents on my dad's side coming over, they got a better life out of it, and they respected that, and they respected capitalism. Um, but at the same time, um, it was the union movement that came up during that time, the OSHA regulations that were put in place that made it workable for the workers. Um, and um, you just have to take all of that experience, which isn't easy, easy to do because you think of the robber barons um, and you think about the Grangers with their pitchforks and the um, unions in uh, Chicago and the Pullman strike and all of this, but it is relevant to where we are today. Uh, because we have the same kind of thing of gatekeepers in a certain area, which tends to depress wages and makes it harder. Small businesses can start all they want, and we want them to, but it makes them harder to grow and be actual competitors. And perhaps my best example of that is the Facebook case, where we'll never know if WhatsApp or Instagram would have developed the bells and whistles on privacy. We'll never know, because in the words of uh, the email that was discovered after the fact by Mark Zuckerberg, we'd rather buy than compete. And these companies could be disruptive to us. Um, and so uh, we've got a lot of evidence that there's bad stuff going on, uh, but we've got to translate that into action. So that reminds me, and when you were running for county attorney way back when, um, you your, opponent, you, of that, yes. <laughs> your opponent said, you're just a street fighter from the Iron Range. Yeah. Um, what did you say? Um, I said, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> said, um, and I would, I would uh, say the same thing uh, today because uh, we need that kind of spirit um, when we take these things on. And um, I really actually had this success just last week on this front of getting more money to the agencies. And as we speak, uh, my amendment to add over a hundred million dollars to the agencies, FTC, DOJ, and I trust, which was bipartisan with Senator Grassley, unanimously got through the committee by rejiggering the filing fees, putting more on the big deals, less on the small ones, is going to be a big deal. And it's going to, it's getting attached to this uh, bill that we have on the floor, uh, the competition bill right now that we plan to pass tomorrow. So it's kind of exciting. And it's just that fighting spirit because I just never gave up on it. Um, and even though it kept getting stopped every which way, um, and we're literally going to get it done, I believe, tomorrow. Now, in your book, you point out that the cornerstones of antitrust law, the Sherman Act, the Clayton Act, they're really old. Um, mm -hmm. I think they're, they're early 1900s. They're even older than the Spanish flu. Um, how would you update them? A um, few things. One, I mentioned already changing the filing fees. I think we're going to get this done now. Um, we can't take on the world's biggest companies with duct tape and band-aids. Um, and these agencies are literally a shadow of their former selves, even uh, where they were when Reagan was president. Uh, secondly, uh, making sure that well, we look at the burdens and we, the lawyers on, the, um, on this webinar know exactly what I'm talking about. And that means um, that when you have a deal that goes, a merger that goes in front of one of the agencies, um, I think you should shift the burden on the real big ones and say the companies actually have to prove that it doesn't hurt competition instead of having the government uh, having to prove it. It's not that radical. Um, Macon Delrahim, who headed up antitrust under the Trump administration, was really interested in this idea, as are a number of other Republicans. Um, and as you noted, Dave, these laws that were Sherman Act, Clayton Act, over time, we kept updating our laws, but we basically stopped. The other thing is to make it easier to look back. 
kind of what happened with AT&T, but it's gotten harder to do because of the Bork theories that have basically crept through our court system to the point where two of the three latest justices that were added, uh, that would be Gorsuch and Kavanaugh, have a clear track record of being literally alone in decisions at the circuit court level uh, when it came to antitrust. Uh, because they were embracing that philosophy so intensely. That has made it really hard to, for plaintiffs to bring these cases, and it cries out for legal change. I guess we could wait 40 to 50 years until there's no competition intact uh, to wait to see if the courts catch up. But I would prefer to make it easier to do with some law changes that, in my mind, actually will bring us back to the original intent, I guess I'm originalist today, original intent of the Sherman Act, which was uh, to be able to take on monopolies. And the courts have made it uh, recently, the last few decades, really since AT&T, much harder to do that. So making it easier to look back and look at exclusionary conduct, making it easier to take on these mergers and then adding uh, funding to the agencies. And then I'd add there's special things you can do in the area of pharma, which is really a problem with uh, pay for delay where they pay off generics, um, making it easier to negotiate under Medicare. There's all kinds of things you can do related to pharma, all kinds of things you can do related to tech, including our recent adventure into the app stores, which is an ongoing major litigation right now between Apple and Epic Games, um, which is relevant to a hearing that Mike Lee and I just did lockstep together on um, with our witnesses of Spotify, uh, Match.com, and Tile, uh, which they told horror stories of trying to deal with the monopolies that are Apple when it comes to Apple phones and Google when it comes to the other phones. Now, you mentioned that there, there's a scholarly movement basically against antitrust, saying that bigger is better and more efficient. Um, what law school did that come out of? <laughs> you are, this is... Next to Stephen Colbert, I think you've had the best interview. Although, if anyone had seen, I'll get to Stephen Colbert and this funny thing he did on the interview in a minute. But the um, uh, the law school was Dave University of Chicago. Yes, my law school, and uh, that wasn't how just you avoid, better. How did you avoid getting infected? It was well. What it was was the Bork theory, which it basically takes a new look at the standard for antitrust, measures it by something he called social welfare, but he includes in that not just consumers and workers and the public good, he includes like how monopolies are doing and efficiency and things that really led to some very conservative uh, court rulings. Um, anyway, so that that was the case. So I'll tell you the Colbert story at the end. Okay, speaking of conservative court rulings, whenever there's been a Supreme Court nomination, you almost religiously ask a series of questions in the hearings about antitrust. Um, what, what is the role of, of changing this, the course of this ship and the confirmation of judges? Um, well, the, um, I think more people need to ask about it, but the reason I did it is because to make the point uh, that these guys were a number of them, and I mentioned Kavanaugh and Gorsuch, but also some of the circuit judges, really, I believe, off uh, when it came to their decisions. Uh, One with Whole Foods, um, um, when it came to uh, Justice Kavanaugh in the grocery area, um, and Gorsuch had one as well. And they were very clear. They had statements that their views were consistent uh, with Judge Bork. So I think that's our job. And it crosses off crosses beyond, of course, the boundaries of antitrust. But I was trying to make the economic case Um, when we looked at those judges. And I do think it's uh, completely relevant. One of the things that's interesting is you look at people now that are embracing doing something more on monopolies, um, like Josh Hawley and Ted Cruz and uh, economic, and also a number of other Republicans. Um, What I think is interesting is they embrace that theory. And sometimes I wonder if they've realized, they've all realized, they won't admit this, but uh, that it's gone too far. Uh, so that even they are now taking on um, really implicitly some of these rulings and decisions and trying to change the law uh, because, and I think they would just say, oh, we have to change the law. Um, But uh, basically this law change is necessitated uh, by some of these court decisions. Uh, One of the things you're best known for in Washington is reaching across the aisle to get things done. 
Um, have you reached across the aisle to Senators Hawley and Cruz? I, I know you have with Senator Grassley, who seems to be um, have almost the same position as you do on all these issues. Well, Senator Grassley and I have multiple bills together uh, when it comes to um, especially pharmaceuticals. And uh, we have this major bill with the funding of the agencies. Um, and um, I have um, my own sweeping legislation on antitrust. And I've got a number of senators on there, not Republicans yet, including Senator Warner. Um, and uh, I do think there's some agreement when it comes to monopolies uh, with some of these conservative Republicans. I haven't agreed with them on some of their theories about, oh, these tech companies are messing up uh, because they have liberals that work at them or because they supported Democratic candidates. I just don't see that. I think it's a much more a monopoly problem than it is a political problem. So some of our solutions are different, but uh, they did support my bill um, to better fund the agencies, which isn't something Republicans usually do. Let's, let's now drill down on big tech. In the book, you point out that the Obama administration really did very little about big tech consolidation, and the Trump administration did very little until the very end. What was the political dynamic in Washington that allowed big tech to consolidate the way that it has? Another good question. So... I think it started out, honestly, innocently enough. I think everyone, both parties said, uh, we'll trust you. This is really hard. We don't understand this stuff, right? Um, and um, they just kind of let them develop. And there was good reason, right? It's a nascent, as to use Mark Zuckerberg's words about what's happened in Instagram. It's way, way back. It's the beginnings of an industry. We want them to develop. We want them to employ people. All of that stuff is great and exciting. But then at some point, we crossed the Rubicon. At some point when, you know, uh, Cambridge Analytica uh, is, gets uh, sold um, uh, 85 million people's data, basically, are they able to access it? Uh, when you have no privacy federal rules that match uh, this highly sophisticated industry, uh, when you have... Um, tech companies that are basically dominating gatekeepers in about five different, four or five different areas. The ultimate example of this going completely wacky is when Apple, when I'm sorry, Facebook and Google are able to hold an entire industrialized country that would be the nation of Australia hostage when they simply want to charge, make sure they're paying content providers, as in news organizations, for the content they use, what do Google and Facebook do? They say, okay, we're taking our marbles, we're leaving your island. Sorry, we know we have over 90% of the search engine business, says Google. Microsoft tries to come in, they have less than 5% of the market share, but they stand up and say, we'll do it. But we know it would have been a mess, uh, because it would have been too hard to ramp that up right away. And basically, there was so much international pressure that they stepped down. I use all those stories as an example. Oh, wait, one last one. When we have our hearing about the app stores, we find out in the course of our questioning, um, Mike Lee and I and many others, Blumenthal, uh, that Google, one of their business people, actually called Match.com the night before the hearing and said, hey, we read what your guy is going to say. And we just looked at your earnings report to your shareholders. And we think when you said you wanted to work with us, now you're saying we're doing bad stuff. We think that's a legal problem for you. Wow. They were threatening them. And that's what monopolies do. So they were, um, interfering, so with, they were interfering with Match.com? Match.com. And so Lee and I have sent a letter. We're following up. We're investigating this. And so this, these are true stories. I'm not just like some you know person on the internet here making it up. And so my point is, these are monopoly problems. And I think the Washington problem was, one, the first thing wasn't a problem. Let's let them develop. Two, uh, we don't really understand this stuff and we're going to pretend we trust them. They seem nice when they come to our offices. Three, the classic monopoly problem. They hire all these lobbyists. They convince everyone it's fine. Everyone sits back. They have hearings where they like are throwing popcorn against the wall, right? Oh, they're trying to get sound bites in for the day. But we never actually do something about it. So my answer to this and why I wrote the book is, Let's look at our history. We've always believed in antitrust way back to Adam Smith. Let's look at some sensible ideas. I put 25 ideas out there and let's get something done. This wasn't the classic, oh, there's a, bipartisan, there's a partisan fight going on. 
I didn't see it that way. I think the Obama administration now, like Gene Sperling, looked back at their time and said, you know what, we shouldn't have let WhatsApp Instagram go by. You know, we thought, well, they're so small, Facebook's so big, so, oh, it's okay. And he has said to the New York Times, as have other people, they should have done more. The Trump administration, you know, they came in saying they're going to do all this stuff. They had some good people they put in place. Um, but Donald Trump himself politicized everything. If for antitrust, he could have been, you know, used it as a bully pulpit. But instead, he kept, you know, blaming CNN. And that's why he doesn't like the deal. Um, and I think that was a lost opportunity. So now we have three strikes and you're out, man. This is the moment. And you've already have Joe Biden putting people in place like Lena Khan at the FTC. That's his nominated person who's gotten a lot of support across the aisle. Out of the box thinker. You've got Kim Wu at the White House. Out of the box thinker. Um, and we're waiting for the antitrust head. So Merrick Garland himself is an expert on antitrust. He um, taught it in law school. Um, and I think it's a real exciting time to finally catch up on what wasn't getting done. We have a question from an audience member, and not surprisingly, it sounds like the audience member is interested in attorney's fees. And the question is, when you update the Sherman and Clayton Acts, will Congress provide monetary incentives for the private bar, attorney's fees, mandatory damages, treble yep. damages, whistleblower, to exactly. motivate the private bar to take on some yeah. of these big cases? Okay, so they should look at um, uh, my bill and some of the other proposals out there. We have um, a building on the one bill that did pass last year, uh, was, uh, and I was a co-sponsor of it, Leahy and Grassley on whistleblowers. Uh, building on that to make it easier in some of the civil cases, actually doing more when it comes to fines. And the questioner is asking this because um, there was one uh, time period before the Supreme Court where plaintiffs were, I think, zero and 15 or something like that. It has become very hard to bring these cases. And aggressive action on antitrust comes from both the private bar and government. Obviously, my focus is more on government right now. Um, but changing the standards and upping some of the, uh, making it easier to bring these cases uh, would be a good idea. And so I'm happy to look at any ideas. I mean, there have been big government cases and antitrust cases before, such as IBM and AT&T, but they got bogged down for years. I mean, they were yes. decades long litigation. Why, why do you think private enforcement is not going to run into the same problem? Well, it, it may well, but let's look at what happened. Even though the AT&T case took a while, it made a huge difference for competition in a telecom and cellular. And IBM didn't even get that great of a result. But during that time, this is what's really interesting about these cases. When these cases are brought, they do create a bit of a pause in some of the monopolistic behavior by the company. And actually you can trace the beginnings of Apple, the beginnings even of Microsoft. Some of these companies came up small during the time there were pauses and they found a way to get their foot in the door and build. Well, right now that is a pretty closed atmosphere if you're a company trying to say compete on the app store level. And I keep bringing up app stores because people need to think about this. We used to just have websites. Now, every average American spends four hours a day on app stores, some kind of app store. That's what they're in. Um, Apple phones, completely dominant by Apple for the app store. And then Google dominate the other phones. What does this mean? Well, if you're Match.com or you are Spotify and you want to advertise it, and you want to have your app store app, which of course you want to have, 30% of your revenues go to Apple. <laughs> 30% of what people spend, and yet they don't charge other companies. So it's really strange why they don't charge Uber, but they charge Spotify when you have Apple Music. Those are the kinds of things we're dealing with that are classic antitrust problems. Well, since Apple is so dominant, would, might there be a legislative fix to the App Store problem? Sure, yes. And that's being attempted in some state legislatures right now and something we're looking at. So it's, um, it is part of when I, when I, what I want to see some specific legislation, but I would also like to see, and this is what has driven me to the hardest uh, mountain to climb, which is uh, the more general changes to the antitrust law. Because while you've been asking about tech, you know, insulin prices skyrocketing, uh, what happened with EpiPen, uh, the story I tell at the beginning of my book on ovation and a case that was brought uh, in Minnesota that didn't go well uh, when one company had the market on a baby heart drug. 
Um, it is across the board. And uh, uh, John Oliver actually did a piece on this where he talked about for half hour, all the consolidation with cat food and sunglasses. And he ended and said, if this is enough to make you want to die, good luck because there's only three casket makers left. And I point out that one of them has bought uh, the other. So my two funny stories from telling that story, as good as your questions are, was I did Al Franken's podcast um, on the book um, about uh, a week ago or so. And he, his retort was that he's decided he's going to build his own casket. And I suggested to him there is actually a guy up in Grand Marais that teaches people how to do that. Um, but the other one uh, was Colbert when I cited the John Oliver uh, thing after about a minute of letting it go. He finally yells and it's on the interview. Cut that out. I don't want John Oliver's name on my show. And I said, wait a minute. Are you being a monopolist? And he said, yes, I am a monopolist of my own show. I am a gatekeeper. And then he looks at the camera and he goes, and Google, I love you. <laughs> he means put me up in the search engine. So it was a lot of fun. Well, we'll Google that episode. Yeah, you should, um, yes. So I, we've got a um, question from a farmer who says, okay. By the way, thank you for your bill to open trade with Cuba for us. As a farmer, the antitrust violations and collusion in the packing industry has not been worse in recent decades. Packers are making over 800 bucks per beef carcass and we farmers are running close to break even. What, do you, what actions do you expect in this area? Okay, um, uh, one, we're gonna have a major hearing on this this summer. Um, uh, Senator Lee and I, we're uh, putting that out there. If we did today, uh, tomorrow, the three hearings we're gonna do in the next uh, few months. Secondly, uh, the bill that I have would make a huge difference. And that's why I usually use the example of ag and I, think I had yet, so I appreciate the uh, question, um, is that's one of them. Um, and uh, you had it really a big magnifying glass on the problem during the pandemic, uh, because you had um, uh, cases where farmers would be trying to bring their cattle uh, or pigs to market. Um, and uh, there were obvious problems with uh, what happened with the supply during the pandemic and demand. But there were also problems for people that only had one meat packer they could go to. And if that shut down because of COVID, there were no alternatives. Um, and so it's just an example of the kind of monopoly we're seeing and why this has to be looked into. So we're having a hearing. My bill would be a good help. And there's also some specific bills out there regarding this issue. One thing we haven't touched on yet is Amazon. I mean, Amazon is an animal like we've never seen turning into a, a monster of a monster. Um, should we feel guilty about shopping on Amazon? <laughs> I shop on Amazon sometimes, but that doesn't mean that. And by the way, by talking about this, it doesn't mean that we want to destroy any of these companies. There are things we can do uh, that would actually enhance competition might mean they have to divest some of their assets here. I'm thinking of some of these other deals I made up that I mentioned here earlier uh, with WhatsApp and Instagram. But with Amazon, they are unique in some ways because they are, uh, you have this issue of monopsonies. We've mostly been talking about monopolies uh, where you'd have, say, Coke and Pepsi merge. That isn't happening. Um, but where um, you have people having to, um, having to have buy stuff from one big monopoly. Monopsonies are where you, you have someone, you have sellers all having to sell to basically uh, one buyer. And when you look at the numbers with Amazon, you have a significant number of their sellers. I think it's one third who only sell to Amazon. Um, and then you have others where it's their dominant, dominant uh, buyer. And that creates a whole bunch of problems and the reason sometimes you put in conditions or you get involved in rules when it comes to this. Um, so that's what's going on there. And um, part of this also, I'd add another one that we haven't talked about, online delivery services, where we had a near, um, a near major problem uh, where there was going to be a combination. They ended up um, pulling it back because there was so much pushback. And by the way, Dave, that happens as well. You'll have deals that are put out there kind of hung out there um, where you have pushback and then they pull them because in the words of President, one of President Obama's 
former antitrust chiefs, Bill Baer, he kept seeing deals that should have never gotten out of the boardroom. And again, part of it, which he means we just will never cut uh, the make it under antitrust law. And the reason companies keep doing this is because these agencies are overwhelmed and a lot of things have gone through that probably shouldn't have, or I wouldn't yeah, I I saw, would the word probably. I saw in the newspaper this morning that the attorney general of the District of Columbia has started an antitrust lawsuit against Amazon, arguing that their power as a buyer is so significant that they can force companies not to mark down their prices in other contexts. In other words, not compete with Amazon. So monopoly and monopsony almost seem synergetic. Uh, yes. And I think it, that's another interesting example because uh, one of the things that's happening is not just DC, you're starting to have attorney generals um, and our attorney general, Keith Ellison, has uh, long been interested in antitrust. He was one of the founders of the antitrust caucus um, over in the, when he was in Congress. You're starting to see attorney generals get involved in these cases. And um, one of the reasons I think we'll see federal action is that one, that doesn't, sometimes it works, but it's very hard. Sometimes it works when they are, do things together. And I'll note with Facebook and Google, um, especially with the FTC with Facebook, they got all these attorney generals and there were some involved with Google as well. But remember, the feds took the lead on those cases, even during the Trump administration, the feds took the lead because if you want real action, it is better to do this with commerce and things federally. But I think you're gonna see so much action on the state basis that it's gonna push federal action. One other example of that is privacy laws because we have failed completely to have a federal privacy law that matches the data privacy violations that we're in and the everything from uh, healthcare data on. Uh, you're starting to see some really aggressive action by states, which has then turned the tech companies after lobbying against federal privacy legislation. Guess what? Let's get federal privacy legislation because it's such a patchwork. And hopefully we will get um, federal privacy legislation, but it should be strong legislation. So Facebook and Twitter um, have certain aspects of monopoly, uh, especially in the social network uh, relevant market. What, we've got a, a viewer who wants you to comment on whether you think Twitter and Facebook should be able to decide what and who is okay to post. Oh, okay. So first of all, let's just remember from a monopoly standpoint, Twitter isn't really um, in that level of this is different than the posting issues, but I just want to make clear, um, Twitter actually testified, I, Jack Dorsey testified that when he had bought Vine, uh, that they basically were pushed out of the market. So they are, have their own problems um, as being a smaller platform sometimes. Uh, number two, when it comes to what they can post, um, there is a lot of stirrings about, um, and I'm going to um, get to start with this, with something called Section 230, uh, which says that you can you can have immunity, and this was again done at the um, beginnings of the internet, uh, that you're not going to be able to be sued. And we actually took a step on that a few years ago when we said, uh, not if you're doing uh, basically human trafficking and you're posting that stuff, uh, you will be li you can be liable for that. Um, some of the Republican proposals would completely get rid of Section 230. I think a better approach is to start carving out additional exceptions, like for misinformation, um, for incitement of violence, for discriminatory content, because I just find it hard to believe that these huge companies cannot find a way uh, to a better um, police their platforms and they're basically allowing, I guess, insurrection being exhibit A, um, a lot of bad stuff out there and misinformation on vaccines when you have this huge hesitancy rate fueled in part, not totally, but fueled in part by people thinking they're going to get microchips, you know, a very common thing on the internet, implanted in their arms. Um, and so um, Senator Warner, who is a more moderate Democrat, is leading this bill of, with the co-sponsors, myself and Senator Hirono, uh, to basically add some other uh, exceptions to this blanket immunity uh, that these companies have. And so that's part of this. In terms of who posts what, I mean, I think this interesting recent um, Facebook committee involving Donald Trump. I support keeping him off the internet as the misinformer in chief. Um, but 
I think basically this committee of experts said, no, Facebook, you've got to put your own rules in place. Their own experts told them that. Um, and I think, again, it's an example where we'll never know if Instagram or um, uh, WhatsApp, I keep bringing these up because they may have um, adopted better bells and whistles on privacy. The two ways you can get privacy in place and do more when it comes to bad players on the internet, one is regulation, but the second is hoping uh, that the capitalist system would have produced some better alternatives. Well, it, it hasn't <laughs> because in part, there is no competition when it comes to a Facebook platform. In reality, there isn't. Um, and so they have bought the major competitors to them. And so that's why, again, I lead this all back to antitrust as a way to develop the competition, not just for prices, but for the quality that we want in these products. Your father, Jim Klobuchar, was one of the great journalists in Minnesota history and now a blessed memory. Um, and he was a strong defender of freedom of the press and you've been a strong defender of freedom of the press. Is there any moral equivalence here to Twitter or Facebook uh, deciding someone can't post and the values underlying the First Amendment? Uh, well, I am a strong supporter of the First Amendment. And uh, what I see as um, the uh, equivalence is making sure that we have news uh, and we have actual reporters that are doing their jobs, including investigative reporters, and not just at the big, big, uh, news organizations um, uh, like New York Times, which does an incredible job, or Washington Post, uh, but also these local news. And to think that we are losing them, there's a, a picture I have in the book of the Denver Post, uh, where it was one year and where it was about five years later, and all the pictures are basically blank of where the reporters used to be, uh, because it is they basically eliminated, um, I think it was almost half their newsroom. Um, and so to me, that's what we should be looking at is how we keep our news strong. And one of the ways you do it is this bill that Senator Kennedy and I have, again, bipartisan with a counterpart in the House that allows the news organizations to um, basically coordinate in their negotiations with the tech companies for content. That was really the issue in Australia. And our laws make this hard for them to do. And how we think the Rochester Post Bulletin is going to be able to negotiate with Facebook and Google um, by themselves is really difficult. As you can imagine, that's why we put a five-year limit, allow them to co coordinate. Mitch McConnell was on this bill in the past. Senator Durbin supports the bill. Um, and so it's another one of my big priorities for the year. And to me, that's the issue when it comes to the First Amendment. We've received several questions from healthcare clients about consolidation in the healthcare industry. And again, I'm not talking about big pharma. I'm talking about, for example, the recent wave of mergers of hospitals, which put small physician groups in kind of a difficult position. On the other hand, hospitals are just kind of gasping, especially rural hospitals, uh, gasping for air because they're the, the, the payment scheme with Medicare is not giving them ample cash flow. How do you resolve the question of consolidation in the healthcare industry? Well, we just had a major hearing, so I suggest our uh, people can watch it um, and, and somewhere in the Judiciary Committee archives there um, on hospitals. And um, we had a patient uh, out of Pennsylvania. We had the issue raised as the questioners are doing on the physician groups. And again, I keep pointing to my bill because we're just not going to adopt. We have hard enough time doing bills in Washington without doing 100 bills, one for each industry. And I believe that if you make it harder um, to have these automatic OKs on mergers and you actually make it easier uh, to have to to be able to make your case that something hurts competition and to be able to look at an industry as a whole, uh, then you're going to be able to have better uh, economy, basically. And the problem, some consolidation works with hospitals, um, but the problem that we heard about in the hearing is what I'm sure the questioners know about, and that is that uh, you basically have rates go up in jurisdictions where you have major consolidations. Uh, you've got issues for uh, competition that are huge. You have them taking over physicians groups 
Um, and then still the number is not going down when it comes to the cost of health care. So there are issues with hospital consolidation that are real. Before I ask my final question and allow you to get out of what must be kind of a hot car. No, it's not that hot. We're good. Got the air okay. conditioning out. Well, I told the audience while we were waiting that I was going to try to get three trivia questions answered during your, your appearance today. Oh, no. We answered the first one, which is uh, you went to the University of Chicago Law School. Right. The, answer, the second question, which was your previous book was The Senator Next Door. Mm -hmm. But the third question was, where did you make your announcement, your presidential announcement? I know that it was one. a blizzard, but, but why don't you tell the audience where it was? It was on Boom Island, um, which is kind of off of Nicollet Island in the Mississippi River. And I, I wanted to do it there because uh, the point was that we need to uh, cross the river of our divides to get to a higher place in our politics. And um, also I made the analogy of the Mississippi River, you know, winding down through our country and the states that it goes through um, and um, how a river um, is a, a literally something um, uh, that was a symbol of our country. And so, um, but I think it was maybe that got lost, Dave, with all the snow. <laughs> so, but the snow showed true grit um, and uh, that will uh, forever mark that campaign. But I was really proud of our campaign. I was proud of um, our staying power and all the points I made in the debates, uh, the endorsement of um, uh, President Biden, uh, which was at a critical time in Dallas. Um, I just talked to him for quite a while yesterday on my birthday. Um, and we were uh, looking back at some of that. Um, and and, um, and I'm proud of the work that he and uh, Vice President Harris, who is the reason I'm in this car, because I agreed to go to a meeting on broadband uh, with Senator Warner and um, Senator Sullivan and uh, um, Whip Clyburn. And it was a very timely meeting that we had to have because we're actually very close on the broadband issue um, um, in terms of our uh, bipartisan agreement. Well, maybe the subtleties of the river metaphors were somehow lost on Iowans, but I'm sure maybe next time they'll understand them. So my last question, um, let's move away from the talk of consolidation in specific industries and get more global on the structure of power in this country. You have famously said corporations aren't people, people are people, and called for a constitutional amendment to repeal Citizens United. Talk a little bit, if you would, about the, the power in Washington that you see from money, dark money and otherwise, and how that's influencing antitrust in this country. Yeah, um, I think this is the major problem for our country is that um, we just haven't been able to get some major things done. And I'd put on that list immigration reform where there's been broad bipartisan support. I put on that list dealing with climate change, which we see right on our doorstep. Um, <laughs> year in and year out, getting worse and worse and worse. Uh, I put on that list some of the competition issues where we've been falling behind uh, the rest of the world. And I would put on that list um, uh, uh, antitrust and the, the work that uh, needs to be done to further that competition. And one of the reasons that's happened is because existing incumbent interests. And if you are a conservative Republican as mad at tech, OK, talk about them. If uh, you are a Democrat that's really upset about farmer prices, well, there you got it. And it's not just uh, that they dominate in certain areas. It's also that they dominate uh, with uh, basically controlling politicians. And yeah, we've come a long way from the cartoon you'll see in my book of these big bloated trusts perching over the U.S. Senate from a a time when senators weren't elected, they were chosen. And in many places, they were chosen by the actual trusts that dominated their states, leading to 100 years of inaction. Well, now, if people are too beholden to big money in politics, or they know if they take a risk, and this is what's most interesting for independents on the call or people that cry, want to see us get more things done, every time you go in the middle, you get whacked from, you know, either side with big money um, coming out. You can't, you don't know where it's from. And that is a big problem. And so that's why not just the repeal of Citizens United through a constitutional amendment, the For the People bill, which I'm actually leading that effort in the Senate with Senator Merkley. We just had another hour long discussion uh, in our caucus today. 
um, where we put some minimum national standards in place for voting. And we've got hundreds of bills um, that have basically been introduced now. Uh, 17 or maybe even more, 19 states where they passed in one house, several like Georgia and Florida, where they've actually been signed into law to make it harder for people to vote. You've seen a major corporate pushback because of that. Those minimum national standards, which are not radical, are in that bill, as is the Dispose Act to pull out the big money in politics and make sure that you know where it's coming from, as is public finance. That's why that bill is so important. So um, more than even the Citizens United decision is getting for the people done. Um, and um, the all-powerful, as you noted, Senate Rules Committee uh, did tie on the bill, but it was after a very productive hearing. And I needed a tie to give Senator Schumer the ability to be able to bring the bill to the floor in a divided Senate. And we got Senator King and Senator Warner, who are much more moderate, to support that bill um, and are really working hard on the procedural notions of how we get this done. This isn't just some talking point. Um, uh, basically, Senator Warnock, uh, who's an amazing new senator, has said um, that you know this is his cause and that he knows exactly what's going on. Some people don't want some people to vote. Um, and he could not have won in Georgia if these laws that they just passed were in place. Um, and that's why um, if you believe in democracy and you want to do something about corporate consolidation or whatever it is, uh, you cannot make it uh, so that we're basically allowing uh, the politicians to pick the voters instead of the voters pick the politicians. And one last, last question. The Quorum mm -hmm. for Senate Rules Committee has been having hearings on what happened on January 6th. We did. Any kind of deal getting done to create an independent 1 6 commission similar to the 9 11 commission? Where are we on that? Sure. So I'm all for that. Um, I think that we have to get to the systemic reasons uh, behind this and make some major recommendations. Um, we'll see this week. There's going to be a vote, I believe, this week in the Senate um, on this. At least that's where we were on this yesterday. Um, and we do have some Republicans that are supporting it. But we also have the report that's coming out from the Senate Rules Committee, uh, which is myself and Senator Blunt and Senator Portman and Senator Peters that lead the Homeland Security Committee. We did a series of hearings. And more than that, we've done some very in-depth interviews um, and are going to use that in our report. That's coming out the week of June 7th. Um, it will have uh, many, many recommendations. It is no replacement for a 9-11 type report, but it is very important because we need to get it out now so we can make some changes to things like uh, the Capitol Police Board and other things. So watch for that, but don't think it's a substitute for a 9-11 type commission. Senator Amy Klobuchar, thank you for joining Fredrickson and Byron and a couple hundred friends of Fredrickson today for this very interesting discussion. Remember the book is called Antitrust. It's one word, you can remember it, and uh, people should read the book. Well, Thanks. Dave, could I also, before you go, just thank you for your incredible service on the Supreme Court, uh, the friendship. Uh, you were the one uh, there, which I know you will never, I will never forget, uh, when we were trying to figure out if I won or lost my initial run for office for county attorney at Nye's Polonais room at three in the morning. And the next day, Dave was the cool headed one that was crunching the numbers and figuring things out um, when everyone else was just exhausted and in shock. And my own mother uh, was taking calls. She was the only one in the campaign office from CCO radio where they asked her if I won. And she said, I have no idea. Do you know? Uh, but Dave knew. Um, and we ended up winning that race and the rest is history. And that's a good friend. So thank you, Dave. You won and you've never lost. And may it always, well, I mean, well, I mean there was I the president. never lost the general election. Right. We will say that I won uh, in the hearts of many. And yes. I think it, and our country won by the results. So thank you. Thank you for your time and attention today. And thank you okay. to our audience for joining us. Be well, everybody. Okay. Thank you for tolerating this in the car, but it worked okay. My yes, arm is really tired of holding up this iPhone, but I'm all good. You can okay. let go now. Okay. Bye-bye. Thank you. See you. Bye.